Good evening and welcome to the American University Museum. And uh, we're gonna have a conversation tonight between the photographer, Claudia Smigrod and the curator, Wendy Grossman on the occasion of their extraordinary exhibition at the American University Museum uh, titled Paper Light. Allow me to introduce our uh, discussants. Claudia Smigrod is a professor emeritus of the College of Corcoran College of Art and Design. She taught there when the Corcoran had a wonderful photography program with an outstanding faculty of photographers who are also great teachers. This was at a time when American University kept photography in the School of Communications and, and not the art department uh, as an offshoot of journalism. So Corcoran was the place to be. Claudia has been the recipient of numerous awards and fellowships and international exhibitions and residencies. Her photographs are included in the collections of the National Gallery of Art, Library of Congress, Smithsonian American Art Museum, National Museum of Women in the Arts, the Chrysler Museum, the list goes on and on. Dr. Wendy Grossman is an independent scholar and curator affiliated with the Phillips Collection and the University of Maryland. She has lectured and published widely on the history of photography, as well as the 20th century European and American modernisms, the intersection between non-Western and Western art, Dada, surrealism, and contemporary art, and is a recognized authority on the photography of Man Ray. Dr. Grossman is currently an Andrew Mellon Senior Fellow at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. So Dr. Grossman, Wendy, <laughs> uh, good evening. I'm gonna turn this over to you. Thank you, Jack. Um, I thought it would be appropriate to start the evening with a toast. <laughs> so I, I encourage everyone to pick up pick up a glass of wine um, and to this in lieu of um, our actual having every opening reception, I'm gonna encourage everybody to, first of all, toast the artist, Claudia, we made Thank it you. to the finish line. We did, um, Thank you. Beth, Kayla, um, Chelsea, the whole team, whole cheers. Team. Thank you, yep. Cheers. So um, on that note, um, I welcome you all to what we hope will be a behind the scenes opportunity here to, to walk you through a virtual tour of the exhibition and to get some insights into Claudia's wonderful project projects. So first of all, I've known Claudia for, oh, wow, we've been having conversations about her work um, since she tracked me down um, at, a, at a Man Ray conversation uh, event. And um, the conversation has gotten only richer over the course of the time. So I'm hoping that we can share with you some of the conversations that we've had over the course. Okay, it's not advancing. <laughs> what am I doing wrong? I'll jump in real quick, Wendy. If yeah. you um, go ahead and click on the PowerPoint, it might activate the screen and then there you, there you go. go. Okay, Good. thank you, technology. All right, so first of all, um, we wanna introduce you to the exhibition um, through these really beautiful installation shots by Greg Staley. We'd like to thank him for these great um, shots of the show and take you in, kind of walk you through and let you see a little bit about how um, we've approached the different parts of the, of the installation and some of um, Claudia's work. I think Claudia, we wanted to start out actually just really before we go into, this is the front wall that introduces you when you go into the exhibition. We wanted to first talk about, I guess we were gonna start with these, um, to actually start to talk about what it is, why paper light? What is the nature of the, um, the projects that you're engaged with that we'll see a decade's worth of work uh, evolving on the walls as we walk around the gallery? Yeah, uh, thank you. And thank you, Wendy. I did track you down that night and you generously gave me your time. So, and you have for years since, so thank you. Uh, this is actually the front and back cover of the catalog because we felt that this really encapsulated the entire exhibition 
which I think of as the interaction between paper, light, form, and imagination. And all of the works in the show are photograms. So to just, we thought it would be best to just very briefly, briefly mention that a photogram is the pro it's the most primal basic of all the photographic processes. You just go into a dark room, you take a piece of white photo paper, you put some, an object on top of the paper, you turn the light of the enlarger on, you turn the light of the enlarger off, you develop it, and you have an image of how light's passing through the object and onto the paper. So that's what a photogram is. So uh, what happened for me was the whole project really began, the genesis of it was when I was in, I had the good fortune of teaching in Italy and I was at uh, a botan the Botanical Garden in Florence and I was in this very, very creative mind space and I looked on the ground and there were these huge gargantuan leaves on the ground. And I thought these would be the perfect photograms because photograms are a one-to-one -one scale. These would be huge because you don't enlarge them. They are one-to-one -one scale. So I picked them up, I went to the front desk and in my best Italian, I, uh, I talked to them, I told them who I was, what I was interested in, and would it be okay with them if I took the leaves with me? And they said, yes. So I went back to the dark room. I put the leaf down, you know, I put the piece of paper down. I put the leaf on top of it. I turned the light on, I turned the light off. I put the paper in the chemistry and at first it looked great. And then everything went wrong. And I thought, I had no idea what had happened. And I was, I was kind of upset. And then I was elated. It was just like a moment. And I realized that there was a whole lot more that I could do with all this. And that's really how the project got started. So that's an introduction to the very beginning. And ironically, we are going to take you now um, to the end. Uh, so in the exhibition, we're starting with the culmination of the project as a way to introduce everybody who comes in to the conceptualization behind what Claudia's project ultimately built after, after a full decade of a series. And we'll see the different projects as we go around. Um, and this is um, the, from the, the uh, last series of the project. And, and Claudia is going to tell us a little bit about the culmination of this and what this project entails. So one of the things that really fascinates me is this combination of text and image that you'll see later on as we walk, as we go through the exhibition. And also, I just love ink. I love the viscosity of ink. And this exhibition was also an opportunity for me to try many things I'd always wanted to do and just hadn't gotten around to doing it. So these, these first two series that you're gonna be looking at, um, this one is called Proof Print, as you can see from the red text. And in a moment, you'll see the, the detail shot. But this really uh, is the conceptual underpinning for the show. I have these four ideas. And one of them is this idea of the artist's proof print, that the artist makes a print that all the prints have to match in printmaking, all the prints have to match in terms of quality and tonality so that the printer can then, it, it's, it, you know, it's sort of like the baseline. So there's a quality that I assign, that I strive for in my prints, the proof print. And the other issue that I like to address, that I'm addressing here is this concept of photographic proof, that we think that the photograph is true and yet, it's not, it's a false truth. And so that's why the final image as you can see in the detail says false truth in what I, I mean, it's just golding, but I think of it as like 24 karat gold, untarnished, untarnishable truth. So the, what, mm -hmm. I was just gonna ask you what, what, so this is a photogram and a mono print, yep. correct? Yep. So the what were the source? What what is it? The, what's the photogram? What are, what are your underlying images? What are the source images for those? For this series, it's an it's a series of images um, from Italian Renaissance painting. As I mentioned, I had the 
good fortune to teach in Italy on several occasions. And when I go to a place, I tend to immerse myself in it entirely. And how can you not immerse yourself in the art of, and the culture of Italy? And so I had, I found some book and, uh, and there were these detail, there were these detail shots of, of Italian Renaissance paintings that were just tipped into the book, but they were all coming out, hanging out of the book. So I used those to generate these, um, the silver gelatin prints, the photogram of that. And then when they were dry, I ran them, I set the type and I ran them through a letterpress. And one of the things I think, you know, our viewers might start to wonder what are those little dots on the corner and notice that in fact, these are not framed and they're not covered in glass. One of the things that we kind of came to the, to the conclusion as we're trying to decide how to, how to take these prints, which are really luscious and the materiality of these prints uh, um, is so palpable that we really didn't wanna hide them behind glass. Um, so the installation team, the brilliant installation team at the Cats yeah. who came up with this program, these are magnets. So actually you are really coming in close contact in, in a relationship to these objects that they themselves were, you know, the direct indexical relationship of the original object to the paper. And you as the viewer have this opportunity to really um, experience them close up and personal. So let's go on to the back wall of the, of the back side of the front wall. And these are two halves of the press print series. And this is everything. Yep. So um, you wanna tell us a little bit about sure. this, this series Thank you. as well. So these are sort of the other two, this is the sort of the, the final two conceptual underpinnings for the show is the acknowledgement and celebration of everything as having equal value. So that it doesn't really, in this, I only speak for myself, but it doesn't matter what I'm working with, I declare it to be valuable, and then I see it as valuable, and I create a print that in my estimation uh, celebrates it. So then in the middle, which you'll see in the next detail shot, is the phrase dreamlight. And that what it talks about is that it really talks about the light itself. And that each of these objects, each of these images, not only in this series, but in the oh, entire- I'm just watching um, Wendy on a Zoom. Um... Uh, <laughs> I don't know what that was. So we'll just continue. I just would... Each one of them- Please, sil silence your screen. <laughs> is that each one of them uh, emulates Dream light, this light that it, it gives all off, it's like where it, it's like coming from inside the print itself. And it produces these prints that I personally think of as candescent prints, glowing, giving off light, giving off their own illumination. So we thought it would be a good opportunity just to take a step back for a minute. Um, to talk about the photogram in its development and where Claudia's contributions to the to the to this to this medium come into the line. So in the 18, 1839, 1840, before the or the uh, actual camera camera images, the first cameraless photographs that were able to be fixed. So the art of fixing a shadow were done by Henry Fox Talbot and Atkins. And indeed the botanical specimen, like the first objects that were part of Claudia's work, I thought this was really very you know, um, synchronistic in its idea that the beginning for her began with also botanical works. But you can see in its most primitive form, what they were really trying to capture was the art of fixing a shadow was absolutely the definition, the fine lines, the being able to see exactly the object as it appears. And you'll notice that right when we move forward, the photogram, which was given up 
in the 1840s, once the camera was introduced and more processes, the daguerreotype, the calotype came into being, the photogram was abandoned because it was a considered a primitive form of photographic development until the 1920s. Um, in which Man Ray, amongst another, uh, a number of others, Christian Schad, Moholy Naj, a number of artists in the early part of the, in the 1920s, rediscovered, um, often by accident. Man Ray accidentally left a, 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 something in, in, in the tray on a piece of paper that hadn't been exposed and saw what came there, and it was magical. And such thus became the rayographs which the only thing that distinguishes a rayograph from a photogram is that it was made by Man Ray. So here we have, in fact, in 1922, within a year um, after he came across this phenomenal, I think, which of course, the total ethos of Dada and surrealism, they were, they were just ecstatic over these objects that were created by chance and different kinds of objects that came into interaction with each other. Um, and Vanity Fair, a uh, Frank Crowninshield came to Paris and he saw these works and he took them back and he, he put this um, page together that appeared with a new method of realizing the artistic possibilities of photography. So it again became a, a, a new expression um, that had its, in the 1920s for the avant-garde, um, a, real, a real interest until we come till now our present day when the phenomenon of it's called the, the new wave in old processes, um, photography's antiquarian avant-garde into which Claudia's practice clearly, clearly fits. So you, some of you may know the work um, of Adam Fuss and other photographers, um, Felix Nussbaum. Um, it, these are, are just artists who've really kind of embraced the new medium or the medium of photography, the old medium, and brought to it, come to it with a, with a very new kind of aesthetic eye and approach. And indeed, coming back to those that we opened up the exhibition with, mm -hmm. um, you can see how very different. So these are not there's a preciousness to the work and that Claudia, I can see, I'm curious when you look at now back at the photograms of say Man Ray or Moholy Naj, um, how do you think of your work in relationship to what they were doing? Well, clearly I celebrate their work uh, as, the, as, as the process and what they were doing at the time and, and Atkins and all those people, we have to celebrate the history. But for me, it's very different. Um, Anna Atkin was a botanist. I'm not a botanist. I'm not interested in what the leaf actually looks like. I'm not interested in the in conveying what it actually is. My goal is to create something entirely unique in and of itself that only exists on this piece of paper, on this single piece of paper. Each image is a one of a kind. It doesn't ever occur again. I do not try and remake the same image twice because it's not interesting to me. Um, I couldn't do it anyway. And I find that there's this magic, this synchronicity that occurs despite what I try and do. And that's what I really celebrate is that these, you'll see this in print after print in the show. If I showed you what I made the, uh, the, the photogram from, except for the scale, you know, the form of it, you'd have no idea that it was the same object at all because it's its, its own entity and its own creation that exists only uh, on the wall of this show. Yeah, one of the things I, I, well, we've talked about it is that it's the ghost of the object. Yeah. And, and, and in it being a ghost of the object, it also has this sort of animation or this sort of life that, that you can really feel when you come, especially when you see the, excuse me, in person, um, they're, they're pretty phenomenal. So um, just to show in the show, um, here's the wall where the understudy, that the first in the series um, a decade ago that when Claudia began on this journey. And I want you to perhaps notice there, there are various grids. Um, we really, from the beginning, when we were looking at all these works thought, a dynamic installation um, would be of showing them not necessarily in symmetrical grids or simple, you know, all, all the grids are different, 
but putting them in conversation with each other um, and laying them out and thinking about how they speak together as a unit um, was a lot of fun putting this together. And again, I thank the installation team for having uh, done a phenomenal job in helping us uh, put these into conversation. So we can go on. So you can see this is, again, the whole the, the tour. So that's the direct, that's the back wall. Once you come around the front wall and come into the gallery, um, that will be at the back. And then um, off to the left is the next series, which Claudia, you want to tell us a little bit about the series here that we're looking at? Yes, thank you. And uh, doing the installation with with Wendy was this uh, really uh, wonderful opportunity to come up with a collaborative approach to the installation, the installation being its own entity also, that I, I, wanted, the, I wanted it to be these living pieces of paper. I wanted the experience when the viewer comes into the gallery almost, almost the same as when you walk into a dark room and you see the prints on the drying racks, that these are living pieces of silver nitrate, basically, and that the, uh, you know, the curling of the images, the, the rawness of process, uh, the way they, they're, on, they're, they're on the wall, but they come off of the wall. So that's what this, that's what uh, was our goal here. In terms of the first uh, series over here, there's the detail shot of four of them. Conversations really addresses this idea of the unintended consequence of when there's text on both sides of a piece of paper that were not a book page that was not set up thinking that anyone was going to combine what was on the front and what was on the back. And what happens is, in my mind, because of the right reading, uh, the right reading language and the, the frontwards and the backwards, is that the images get this, they have this like concealed language in them, and that we can read it, some of it we can read, I have no trouble reading backwards text, but sometimes the backwards text is, is more legible than the frontwards text, sometimes there's a photograph, sometimes there's just two, images sometimes, like in the case of the image um, in the lower left where there's just those heads, there's nothing on the back, but because the, we see the reverse, you know, we see the inverse of the image, again, that prints have this sense of inner life when there's a dialogue, hopefully in my mind, a conversation between the actual pieces of paper, the, the, you know, that the, um, the subject, is talking with, is in conversation with either with himself, with the viewer, however, however you choose to look at it. And that these flip of tones and this image uh, interplay of text and image, as you saw with the letterpress process, continues to be really fascinating for me. So as we go around the gallery, um, so that was the left wall from the back center. And then we turn over to the right. And here Claudia has actually taken up a very um, interesting conversation with translucency and opacity. And as you can see from the works, and we'll actually, I think probably here best, we should go right up to a close up. Um, and you can see um, the, the, the degree to which certain works, light does not trans transfer through um, and other ones they do, but the kind of forms that get uh, imprinted on the paper in these photograms. So Claudia, I, I was always fascinated when you told me the story of how this came about. Can you wanna tell us? Oh, so I think, so most people, or myself included, when I'm going to make a photogram, I'm going to use something that's going to transmit light. And it has to be a certain form that I'm interested in. Um, you know, without the form, without the objects, they're chemograms, just painting with chemical. While that's very interesting, it's not what I, it wasn't my intention. And so once again, I found myself in Italy. Uh, once again, in Italy, there's a long period of wait until we can, you know, I could get the paper that I had ordered. And so the town where I was is based in an, a you know, 800 years of Etruscan heritage. So on the shelf, there were a couple of Etruscan pots. 
that I just loved the form of, but I knew the light wouldn't go through them. So as I was waiting for my paper, I made a, a paper mache, a Truscan pot, you know, based on, I, I used it as a form. I was very protective of the po original pot. I made a paper mache form, thinking that the light would go through it, which it didn't. It was a total failure again. So I just thought, well, you know what? My paper came in. I'll just put the pot down. I love the form and I'll make a photogram of it. And then what happened was because the light didn't go through the pot because it's ceramic, it was an opportunity to use the glaze, the chemistry to reglaze the pot, to create a surface again, to create an entity that it is, it's not true. It's just there on this piece of paper. And so it was this um, blending of, it was almost like firing the pot in a kiln, except it was floating in water. And then after I did that, uh, I'm also still really fascinated by the dance of light, the play of light. And I, I realized that um, if you remember in those uh, botanical prints with the, with the, um, the crystals, Typically, photograms are against a black background. Well, the black, while it's lovely and lush, it also kind of sucks up and, and encompasses all sorts of information that I could see in the developer, but then it was getting, you know, it was going away, it was going to black. So then I realized if I cut back on the exposure, I turned the light of the enlarger on with these vases, there was this dance of light, this illumination of light. As it, as it bounced off of the thick, thick, thick glass vases like smoke. And that's how I did the, the ones, the, the translucent, that's how I was dealing with the translucent glass. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, one of the things that strikes me, uh, and this is true of probably anything you see on the screen, um, but these, these works are truly incandescent, the word that, that Claudia likes to use in talking about them. So I, I really want to encourage everybody to actually go come and see them because there's a lusciousness, a real materiality to the works that um, are hard to convey, but you know, they really are kind of magical. So um, we'll, take, we'll, we'll take you a tour around the corner um, and to this next series, which has a whole different, I mean, a, a different kind of engagement that as Claudia sort of in, in the true data surrealist uh, tradition, you know, finding op found objects that then to play with and to engage with and then come up and create something with a totally new and different meaning. So let me, you want to just start talking and Claudia, I'll take, I'll take them in on a closer view, but if you just want to maybe introduce sure. the, the series. Thank you. So scale, as I mentioned with photograms, it's a one-to-one -one scale. And one of the other components of the exhibition is that the prints are all different sizes. Some of them are um, you know, nine by 12, some are 11 by 14, some are 20 by 24, they're all different sizes. And one of the reasons that they're different sizes is because the objects are different sizes. And so it, it's, one approach would be to just use a, a large piece of paper and then make a small, put a small uh, either dress or pair of pants or something inside it. But that's not what I wanted. Also, initially, I was interested in using all the paper that I have. And so I was matching the object scale wise to a certain size piece of paper. So when I got involved with working with these uh, articles of clothing, it was really fascinating. So I had to pick clothing scale for different size pieces of paper. And it's fascinating to me how these, these vestiges exist as an evidence of not only who was, that someone was wearing them, but that they existed in a time and now they're remnants and sort of flattened. And one of the reasons I got interested in working with clothing is because I was always fascinated with the tissue paper when I used to sew that came, I don't know, I don't think it's like this anymore, but when you would get a pattern, it would come with a tissue paper directions. You know, you'd cut it all out and you put it together and then you'd make something. So I thought it'd be interesting to just make something new on a photo piece of paper. 
And so we see like in the dress that appear is burnt, um, it's, you know, it's, it's almost as if it's a remnant from a lost time. And I find it fascinating that the image in the middle, it's, 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 we almost see it underwater, submerged in water, taken out of water. It's like I see it in the tray when I'm making it. So it's, it's lying flat, but it's also uh, vertical right in front of me. And then in the final image, how, how we, can, we can craft this object, this sort of hair dress, just with chemistry. And I think that they also speak to, all of them speak to the power of the inner white, the power of white and, and how white becomes light. So I think that they, um, these vestiges of existence are really quite fascinating for me. Yeah, and I, I also, one of the things that's fascinating to me is these works, all of them, that the work that you're doing is on the one hand, recognizable, yeah. at the same time, mysteriously opaque. And I, I think that's probably a quality of the rareogram in general, um, yeah. but there is that kind of, you know, yin and yang, that tension between, you know that there is something that was there and you try to figure out what it is and recognize it, but at the same time, there's a, true, a total mystery. Um, and, and also, I mean, I, again, I remember the first time you were showing some of your work to me and I was like, how did you do that? How did you, how did the chemistry create these kinds of, you know, engagements? And, and going back to my, one of my questions in the beginning, I mean, I think that is something, you know, really uh, new that you're bringing to this process of the photogram that's dealing not just with fixing a shadow or with light, but playing with painting with chemistry, I think is actually how you explained it to me initially. Well, one of the things that really um, fuels me is I love to make things. I just love to make things. And it doesn't matter if it's photographs, it doesn't matter if it, it doesn't matter what it is. Ceram I just love to make things. And so the physicality of working with the paper and creating something that is actually within the paper appears three-dimensional and yet flat is, uh, is really, uh, as I say, it fuels me. And one of the problems that I've had with photography for the entire time, the whole 50 years, you know, that I've been doing it is the flatness of it. And that's why these pieces of paper are like these living entities that are so exciting for me. And it doesn't matter if it's a dress, it doesn't matter if it's a pot, you know, it's an opportunity to start with a form, to walk into a dark room and to come out with something that's totally unanticipated. Uh, I have no idea of, other than the form itself and the paper of what's going to happen. And it's exciting for me, yeah. Well, it's exciting for those of us who get to see. Thank right? you. I'm glad that you like to make things instead of destroy things because <laughs> we've gotten something completely different from that experience. So these are actually the end of the exhibition as you come around the room and um, they're the two final series, um, Time and Space and Paper Light Redux. So I just wanna show you them in their in, in, in their installation view. Um, and then, you know, maybe kind of, why don't we hone in um, first on the time and space and talk a little bit um, about what's going on in this series. So these are really interesting to me. Again, it was an opportunity um, to just try things I hadn't really, I thought about, but I hadn't ever done before. And, you know, when I first walked in the dark room many, many years ago, I was just in love with photography. And I'm very fortunate because I, that continues for me. And so I, for me, because it has so many iterations, photography, there, there's all these ideas that I have and there's all these things that I can do. So for these, these really address, there are six of them in this series, and these address this, the concepts of time and space. That, that it's, just, you know, it's so simple in my mind that if we take an image 
and invert the tones and we take the sky that was white and we make it black, that we've switched time from day to night. And so when you switch time from day to night, the image in my mind has this inner glow. And yet it's also an opportunity to not only deal with time, but to deal with space. And the space of the canvas of the image in relationship to the piece of paper itself is really important to me. I embrace process. I embrace the opportunity to, um, to just do whatever I need to do to make things work. And in this, it was, it's very simple. I just made, I had lantern slides that I found a whole supply of. Uh, they weren't, I wanted to make them larger. So I stuck some, um, uh, the positive, the film and an inkjet printer. And of course I didn't know what I was doing. And so I put it in backwards and the ink didn't dry. And it was like the coolest thing I'd ever seen. And then I didn't have any big, you'll notice a lot of this is um, problem solving. A lot of my work is problem solving. I need a bigger piece of paper. So I'll put down four pieces of paper. I need a bigger lantern slide. I'll put down, I don't have large enough um, uh, transparency film. I'll put down Four, I'll scotch tape them together. I don't care if you see the scotch tape. I don't care, I embrace process. And so for these, uh, they deal, they really address this idea of entropy and disorder and chaos and misuse, the, you know, doing it the wrong way, the misuse of light, the misuse of chemistry, the misuse of the photographic process, obviously the misuse of the environment itself. And so what I did was, it's interesting to me that art history was taught with lantern slides and you know if you're going to see a picture of whatever piece of artwork they're going to show it's all masked off so that that's all you see it doesn't matter what was next to it so I just took off the cover so you could see whatever was next to it and you'll see on the um the picture on the left you know how there's an image sort of slightly revealing itself on the bottom. And so for me, that's an opportunity to continue and extend the frame and the space. So it's really, for me, about chaos, misuse, um, misrule. Beautifully said. I have to say Thank the you. conversations that we've been having and listening to, <laughs> listening to you talk about the process that behind and the thought process behind some of these works um, has really been fascinating. And I'm glad you explained a lantern slide. I think for probably a lot of people <laughs> um, never heard that that, you know, these old things where, you know, I yeah. mean, I, it's interesting student, most of my students that they have don't even know what a slide is, let alone a lantern yeah. slide. So. Well, and these are only three inches square. And yeah. so uh, my original intention was just to use them uh, to make contact prints with, but um, they're just fabulous things. And so I think that they're, they're examples from a historical uh, vantage point of something that has, it's what I was talking about with the everything, the implied power and specialness of something which for me translates into everything. I love architecture, I love bridges. I took all the slides I could find of bridges and I just love them. Uh, when I was a kid, I had two toys. I had blocks and I had an erector set. And you can see it when you look at all these prints. And I don't say that begrudgingly, those are the best two toys you could ever have, yeah. So before we go on to the last to the last series, yeah. I just I just want to comment that one of the things from the time and space series that that really fascinated me is they remind me of this like there's a nostalgia to them. You know, there's this idea yeah. that there's something there. Okay, that that is some place that existed. We don't know if it still exists or not. And so that's yeah. sort of the the time element. You know, the this place. And and I find myself trying to like place that place on the one hand it's familiar you yeah. know you make the familiar unfamiliar and the unfamiliar more familiar in the sense that you are really i i find maybe i've had too much wine but <laughs> I, I i am finding a real kind of um yeah engagement with that kind of time and space element of this series so should we go on to the last one yes please okay so interestingly enough 
paper light redux. You may notice paper light, which is indeed the title of the entire project. Um, but, and this was an early set, right? An early part of your um, experimenting with uh, yeah. paper light. Where the idea of the name paper light actually first was introduced to your process, right? That's right, yep. And then I decided to use it for the exhibit itself. And this is a, for me, a real appropriate final slide because it represented one of the many illuminating moments that I have had when I was making all these. Plus what's really important here, it brings me back full circle to the acknowledgement of two other people. And Caitlin Bohr, who contributed with, to the essay. And I showed her these way a long time ago when I was making them. And it was her enthusiasm and her interest in them that um, I found tremendous, uh, not only gratitude, but inspiration to keep making them. And so it was her support. And these reference um, all sorts of things for me, you know, they reference the sun, the moon, but they're so ocular and they're full of uh, sort of solar flare and stuff that's all over them, silver that's con you know collecting on the surfaces. And then the final person is Jake Dingman, who wrote the essay, Where Does the Light Come From? This is my son. And he wraps this all up so insightfully in his essay, Where Does the Light Come From? Because that's what this is all about. That's what happened when I did this series. I was reading an article in the Farmer's Almanac and I was waiting for someone. I don't normally read the Farmer's Almanac, but it was pretty great. And the editor wrote about walking. It was, it was in winter. He walked down to a frozen pond and he looked, he stood on the frozen ice and he looked underneath and he could see the fish swimming. And I thought, how is that possible? Where's the light coming from? How can he see beneath the surface when there's no inner illumination? And then I started to think about this idea. I was making these at the time and I was thinking about black ice. And I was thinking about this, this vision that comes from inside and this light that comes through from behind. And then all the projects came from there. Mm -hmm. Well. Thank you. That's that's a very beautiful um, in conclusion of our of our virtual tour. Um, as I said in the beginning, I, I think the situation is coming becoming such that we will hopefully all be able to gather in not too far in the future here. And um, Jack's going to organize a party for us that we didn't get to have with the opening, right, Jack? <laughs> And um, so we take you back to this is what happens when you walk in the room full full circle. Um, and you know, thank you for that, Claudia. And I, I'll end with a toast. We'll end with a toast thank <laughs> to you. everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. And we are open now to any questions, um, comments. Appreciate anything that people would like to um, bring into the conversation. Well, thank you, Wendy and Claudia. Uh, that was most candescent. <laughs> uh, you know, I think it's I think it's fair to say that of all the visual arts, photography probably suffers the least from being put on a screen. Yeah. You know? But that's not true with these works. I mean, you yeah. really have to be there. They are such beautiful physical objects. Uh, Thank you. I can't stress that enough. And and fortunately, the museum is open to the public Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays, eleven to four. And it'll be here until May 22nd. So you have a little time to uh, experience this show. And I really you know, strongly urge everybody to uh, come on down. Um, we have a few questions. And, and please, uh, now's a good time to submit questions if you want to uh, have them addressed. Uh, we have one in the chat room, uh, chat box. Uh, it seems that your work, Claudia, is centered around process and the abstraction of process. When you choose to bring in recognizable imagery, uh, as in the bridge, how do you choose the familiar images that you use? Okay. Um, so for me, uh, it's this tap dance. You know, photography tends to be a lot 
spoken what's spoken about a lot in photography is process and and how something is done for me personally that's not really um that important to me it i understand that when people look at these they're uh, somewhat confused because they're black and white prints they're not black and white but each print like the bridge each subject matter that i pick for the form and the content appeals to me in a certain way that um, it's pretty um, spontaneous the way I pick them. It doesn't matter if it's the gauziness of the fabric, the um, angle of view of the bridge that I know when inverted will have these tones that will just flip and you know flip invert and then we'll address time. So the uh, content of each print itself is really important to me. I don't know if that answers the question, but I, I pick them fairly instinctively. I mean, when I do the conversation ones or when I get the fabrics, I'm holding them up to the light. You know, it's really important to me how they do or do not transmit light. Well, here's a here's an interesting one. Uh, in the series proof print, which is right on the screen right now, huh? the eyes are extraordinary. What was the intentional, was that intentional or an amazing discovery after the fact? I suppose we all think of eyes following you around the museum from the original paintings, but uh, evidently there's something going on here with your, your version. Yeah, it's a great question. It was, just, you know, when I first, when I first ran these through the press with that red ink, I had no idea that it would be translucent and you would see the image underneath them. Mm. And they kept, you know, the type is set so that the type is in the same place for every print. And coincidentally, it catches the eyes. And it's amazing what happens with the eyes. And maybe um, because many of them are portraits, I mean, they're, they're not all portraits, but they're portraits. And it's the um, unintended, it's the spontaneous interaction of where the type was with the image underneath it. But I embrace what happened. Very good. Uh, here's one. Man Ray was mentioned earlier. Can you tell us which contemporary photographers have been most influential in respect to your work? That's really hard because um, uh, I've been Better not leave anybody out. <laughs> well, that's the problem. I don't want to leave anyone out. And you know, I have had the extreme gift, good fortune of having a career at the Corcoran where not only did I work with the incredibly talented students, faculty, museum staff, endless. I am so fortunate and I saw so much work. And I have been teaching photography for so many years that what's happened is it's really not any one individual's work. It's more the vocabulary of photography that has become ingrained in me. So that as I teach and the words that I use, grains of silver, um, text and image, they become not only part of my vocabulary, but part of my thought process and so, and my, my methodology of working. So it's less about any one individual. I mean, of course, I have favorite photographers, but uh, it's really more about the idea of working and making pictures and making something every day. That's what's important to me mm -hmm. is to just make work every day. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Here's a related question, perhaps. Uh, I know how many prints you make, Claudia. <laughs> How do you decide which ones to keep to show? Maybe this is unanswerable, but I love some of the ones I've seen you discard. Oh, well, <laughs> yeah, thanks. So I have a lot of prints. I have a lot of stuff. And different work is appropriate at different times. And so my approach for this particular exhibition, um, I've been showing Wendy the work over many years now. Um, knowing how much space or how little space I had, sort of, um, uh, 
you know, forced me to uh, not bring it all. And then the work that I brought, I only brought the work that I thought would, um, would, would um, really contribute to the overall installation. So it didn't really matter to me that some had to come out because if they weren't that artist's proof quality, they wouldn't have been there anyway. So I have a lot of work, yeah. But let, let me let me add to that. I mean, one of the things that's interesting, a little, a little secret, um, when Claudia picked the for the details as we went through each of the close-ups for each of these installations, um, you may have noticed that some of the works that she selected to do in close-up aren't in the exhibition. Um, and in fact, when we were in the exhibition, I mean, a lot had to do with, you know, we had so much wall space and so many works we could put in. So uh, what worked together in conversation, just because they aren't in the exhibition doesn't necessarily mean that they're rejected. Um, in fact, there's some that are in the catalog that actually aren't in the exhibition. And what was really liberating was not feeling, um, you know, wedded to the fact that the catalog and, and the exhibition had to have a one-to-one -one correspondence. So, you know, you, you, you need to experience both. And, and indeed, there are many more prints out there in the next exhibition. They'll get their, they'll get their show. They'll get yes. to be seen. Yeah, so much work. And uh, the installation, the, the, the relationship of the images to each other really dictated what would be in the show. And I also, we, we took out a lot of work because uh, I didn't want it to look like the kitchen sink, you know? I mean, it was really important what was in and what, and the space, the spatial relationships of the images themselves. Yeah. I, I really didn't want to you know, try to limit the number of pieces you put. So I, I didn't really put any limits, but uh, you exceeded it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I remember the look on your face, Jack, when Claudia came in with her, you know, crates of images and you, your eyes kind of got big. It's like, you're going to get all those in here, huh? But I think the grid, you know, the kind of combination of the creative grid formulation have, have you know, really worked nicely to, to create kind of a, a conversation between the works. Mm -hmm. Plus, you know, relative to the way, uh, to, to many contemporary photographs, the prints are rather small. And you know, as compared to wide format inkjet prints, and so with that, with the absence of a mat and a frame, uh, mm. there's room for a lot more work, and work that can uh, talk to each other and to reformulate itself in this um, in this new environment. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, they do. Uh, I guess uh, talk and and play very well with each other. Uh, I guess because they're in series and they. Yeah, but it's it's really beautifully put together. Thank you. Um, Italy seems to be a physical location where you draw particular inspiration. Do you have any theories about what makes that place so nourishing um, to your creativity? Besides the food, I suppose. Yeah, food's pretty good. Um, well, I mean, I don't take this lightly. I didn't have a passport until I was 49 years old. So I went there and I guess I was just ready to receive the beauty and the creativity and everything about the environment there. Plus, returning there over the course of time on a limited basis, learning the language, having, this is very important, having a working darkroom available to me while I was there, allowing me to work while I was there, uh, it, um, it, it combines my, you know, my ability to teach, my ability to make work. It's like my whole life happened in Italy. And uh, it, you know, my, it's been on a recurring basis, a source of tremendous ins inspiration for me. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a question for both of you. Uh, what's next for you both? <laughs> oh, what's next, Wendy? I've been talking, what's next? Well, oh yeah. Well, that's that's that is a whole other chapter. Um, um, I'm here at the Met working um, on a project about um, a Man Ray story. I was going to say my my life. Man Ray has sort of led my life in on all kinds of interesting journeys, um, and it's the the research that I have done on Adrian Fidelin, 
who was the uh, his muse, his partner for the last five years he was in Paris from 1935 to 1940, and who historically has been written out of both the narrative of his life, the histories of surrealism, um, the, his photographic history. So um, I've been working on a project that includes bringing her story back in um, to the narrative and in particular, uh, a particular aspect relationship to a collection in the Met of headdresses from the Congo that mm -hmm. her wearing in, in a photograph of her wearing one in that was reproduced in Harper's Bazaar in 1937 made her the first black woman to be um, featured in a major American fashion magazine. So my project on my, my man ray journey continues. Um, this is another side, another um, offshoot of, you know, many years dedicated to his life and, and, and practice. Beautiful. So Claudia, what's next for you? So I have this goal that before I leave Earth, I want to use all the paper and film that I have. <laughs> and so I'm currently working with uh, paper negatives and um, making um, uh, pinhole, pinhole cameras uh, to uh, to continue this experimentation of shining light through paper, to diffuse, to use the fibers of paper to create this otherworldly look. And so I'm spending my days now building larger pinhole cameras. I'm making one that'll hold a 16, 16 by 20 piece of paper because I have a stash of 16 by 20 paper. You know, it's, it's kind of easy for me when I have the end, the answer, which is the paper. So then I make the camera to fit it. Um, so that's my goal is to just keep using it, using all this stuff and make more work, make something every day. Yep. Well, we can't wait to see, see that. Thank you. What you do next. Uh, so I think that's about the time we have. Uh, I want to thank, uh, you, uh, Claudia and Wendy for your great, great collaboration on the show. The catalog is, is beautiful. Yeah. And, uh, and as I say, you can come to the museum 11 to 4 Thursday, excuse me, Friday, Saturdays, and Sundays. Uh, and hopefully we'll be able to loosen up a little bit more than that as we progress but, uh, through the, through the uh, run of the show. But you really have to uh, make the time to come down. And thank you all for attending. Uh, thanks so much. And uh, we'll see you the next time. Cheers. Cheers, and I would like Cheers. to say thank you to everyone at the Cats Inn. Everyone I've worked with there has been so professional, and the designer, just from the moment she picked the image for the cover, she got it. It, it was just lovely for, it was a gift for me, and especially having all of this, the, the, no, the knowledge that this show would be up, no matter how long it had been postponed, allowed me, it just fueled me through COVID and continues to, so I'm really grateful. So thank you to everybody. Great. Congratulations, it's fantastic. Thank you.